Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. We're just thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to continue on in the study of your word while we still have time. I thank you, Father, for just all of that you've given us in Christ. And I ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness, all of the error, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're continuing on in our study in John. This will be uh, John part six, chapter one, verses 19 through 23. And we're gonna be looking at John the Baptist and baptism in a, in a very real sense. John actually reveals who we are, what we stand against in this world before we, the Lord takes us home as far as ministry goes and our announcing uh, the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. I want to read a couple of verses here real quick. First, first Peter 3, 21, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but a, an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, and that's not water baptism, that's spiritual baptism, have put on Christ. As, for as many of you as have been baptized, you, that's not something that we did. That is a spiritual baptism, the Holy Spirit identifying us with Christ. The word baptizo in the Greek means to be identified with. And so, Looking here at the verses, uh, beginning with uh, verse 19. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? They come and they want to know who he is, who John is. As I pointed out in a previous video, we have no, no indication whatsoever that he was that John the Baptist was formerly educated in the way in the ways of the of the, the Jews of Israel. And yet the whole nation goes out to him and, and asks to be baptized. And that has got to bother the Sanhedrin. When it says that they were sent by Jews from Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, I think that's the Sanhedrin. Now folks, these were the people who wanted to know if they had looked at, at everything that uh, that Jesus of Nazareth was doing, his birth, the, the situation that surrounded his birth, the wise men that came seeking for him, a couple of years later, the miracles that he performed, the things that he said, being experts in the Old Testament scriptures, or so-called so experts, I put that experts in quotes, they would have seen that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Now, please don't misunderstand me here. I, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not, I have no intention of running down the Sanhedrin. First of all, I'm told by the Holy Spirit that their eyes were blinded that we might be grafted in. Since they were set aside and we were grafted in, I think, well, you know, what it's going to be like when they're brought back, when their fullness comes in. So we know that God had a purpose in this, but there's another side to that, and that is that some of the Sanhedrin represented that adulterous nation of Israel who were anti-God, who weren't God's children. So it was a mixed group. Their eyes didn't need to be blinded. They, they already were, but I think in Romans, the blinding of the eyes of the nation and the Sanhedrin represents the nation. They had to do something with John. John was very popular. And he had a consistent record. So they went out from Jerusalem and they said, Who are you? 
I mean, that, that question is hard to miss in the text. John could have said, I'm the Messiah. He could have, and, and he, he might have gotten away with it. I don't know, but he didn't say that. He has a consistent record. He has a consistent witness. The word in the authorized version translated record is our Greek word for witness. Who art thou? Now, I have a threefold expression here. He confessed, denied not, and confessed. And from that I gather that there must have been some, some temptation in the question for John to exalt himself. And the Holy Spirit wants us to clearly understand that he didn't do that. And so we have this threefold expression. He confessed, denied not, and confessed. Confessed is the word homologeo. He consistently said the same thing. Imagine how many people, you know, thronged out to John's baptism and he was consistent in that. He did not exalt himself. And it seems to me that the Holy Spirit in very clear language is telling us that whatever temptations there might have been in John's life to exalt himself, he didn't do it. He said, I am absolutely not the Christ. And we all know that, of course. I mean, just about everybody, I don't believe I ever met anybody who thought, who walked up to me and said, Steve, do you think John the Baptist was actually, you know, Christ? We know that. So, any skillful look at the Old Testament scriptures would surely point out the fact that he was not the promised Messiah. He didn't meet the criteria, but he did meet the criteria of Isaiah chapter 40. They ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. And why did the Holy Spirit pick Elijah here? Traditionally, we're told that the Jews expected Jeremiah. However, in Malachi chapter 4, they traditionally expected Jeremiah. But in, in Malachi 4, we're told that in the last days, God's going to send Elijah, the prophet, back. But that's not this time. That's the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to rule and reign in righteousness. And ah, we suddenly have a key that, they're, that, that these... Jews are looking at half-truths. They're anticipating a reigning Messiah, not a suffering Savior. That's the picture, folks. That's what's going on. They're not looking at the one whose visage was so marred more than any man, or who was pierced, who was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. No. They were looking at the one whose name would be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. And so when they asked, are you Elijah? Their minds are prophetically ahead to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to rule and reign in righteousness. John the Baptist acted like Elijah, but he's not the fulfillment of that prophecy regarding Elijah because that prophecy precedes the rule and the reign of Christ, not his coming the first time, to suffer and die. And so John said, I'm absolutely not Elijah. Art thou then that prophet? And he said, no. And that prophet, I assume, refers to Deuteronomy 8.15, where Moses says in the last days, God will send you a prophet like me. And for that reason, many of the Jews expected that prophet to be Jeremiah, who is to be like Moses, the problem is, the prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 is of Jesus Christ. Moses isn't saying, I'm going to send you another Moses. Moses is saying that there's going to be a leader of the people come who's going to bring them out of captivity and into rest. And that's Jesus Christ. And so some of the commentators, they've looked at this and they've said, well, they can't possibly be referring to Deuteronomy 18, but they were, and they refer it 
They, they refer to it a couple of other places. We'll see it again here in John and in Matthew, where that they expect another human prophet like Moses. But in Acts, in both chapter 3 and chapter 7 of Acts, we find the Holy Spirit referring that prophecy to Jesus Christ. So they were looking for a prophet. They should have been looking for a Redeemer. And they didn't understand Deuteronomy 18.15. And for anybody to su suggest that these brilliant Jews who ran the Sanhedrin, I mean, if you want an expert in the Old Testament Scriptures, they're it. Baloney. Their eyes were blinded. They didn't even understand Deuteronomy 18. <coughs> they didn't understand it to be Christ. But the apostles did in Acts. Stephen did. Young Stephen, before he was stoned, pointed out to these brilliant Jews that the prophecy that they thought might refer to Jeremiah really referred to Jesus Christ. And so the question in verse 21 highlights the fact that the Sanhedrin did not understand the Old Testament Scriptures. And he answered, John answered, absolutely not. And so then they said unto him, who are you? You know, we've got to answer uh, the Sanhedrin. They sent us here. We can't go back without an answer. What do you say of yourself? Who are you? And man, he could have said, you know, I think, you know, well, John could have said, well, you know, I haven't worn very good clothes. You know, I've, I've had a rough life. I've suffered quite a few bee stings. You, just, you wouldn't believe how much trouble it is to rob that hive, you know, of its honey. And how much work it is running around catching locusts without a net. I, you know, I don't know. He could have said a whole bunch of things. He could have said, well, my name is John. And I had a mother named, named Elizabeth and a father named Zacharias. And, and, and I, man, I was born under rather miraculous circumstances, you know, because they were too old to have a kid. He could have said a lot of things. You would, you would think at least the answer to that question is, you know, at least, at the very least, he would have said, I am John, son of Zechariah. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. He said, I, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. He answered with Scripture. Now, that doesn't seem out of place when you're talking to a theologian. These were the experts in the Scriptures, and so he answered with a verse that they should have understood. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. They should have known that. They should have anticipated one crying in the wilderness, but that's the wrong place to cry. If anybody's going to come and announce the Messiah, it's going to be in the temple, right? It's going to be in the circles where we move. We, the experts in the Word, in, in the Word, we who know the Word of God, and we've just seen a verse where they don't. They didn't even understand the prophecy in Deuteronomy 18. They're accused of Christ, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of killing the prophets, not only not understanding the Word of God, but killing those who did. They're anticipating that the voice shouldn't be in the wilderness. But that's where God's people are. They're outside of the ecclesiastical system, and that, folks, is where we are. A voice crying in the wilderness, answering with Scripture to people mostly who cannot hear. Those who are of that world system, that ecclesiastical system, based on human merit. Folks, we are a small online church. Granted, the privilege by God to minister across the web and to share our thoughts on social media platforms 
and if we all live down the road from each other, we might have a, uh, we might have a small white little country church with a tiny little steeple because, you know, you know, sometimes it rains. Or we may grow to be a mega church. Actually, in, 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 a, in one particular sense, we are. Even with the, the low number of views that this channel gets, if you added up the views in a, in, in a week, more than, uh, more than, uh, that's more than what the churches in my area are, that I'm seeing. But we're outside of the ecclesiastical system. God's people were in the wilderness when John cried, and that's where we were, and Jesus Christ found us and drew us to himself. They didn't want the voice in the wilderness. They wanted it in Jerusalem. They wanted it in the temple. They wanted it in their circles. And yet John is quoting Scripture. Amazing what God does. Simply amazing what God does. Why would God have such a small, tiny little country over there in, in the middle? I mean, this is God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Man, the biggest continent on earth. I mean, that's got to be where God's people are, right? God never does it that way. That's the way man would do it. We wouldn't have the voice crying in the wilderness, but God does. He moves in amazing ways. He said, it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Instead of going to the temple, these folks went all out into the wilderness to hear John and to be baptized, that is, identified with Christ. That's the picture that we're looking at right here. That's the picture. So I want you to look at the similarities, folks. I mean, uh, just just to quickly review here. There's no, no indication that John was formally educated in any way, yet the whole nation goes out to him and asks to be baptized. People from all over the place. And that's got to bother the religious authorities. Their eyes were blinded, but they were a mixed group. Some of them represented that adulterous nation of Israel who were anti-God. They weren't God's children. We see that, that John had a consistent witness, okay? That he did not exalt himself. And when you think of, of the number of people that must have flocked out to be baptized by John, he did not exalt himself. The Jews, they were anticipating a reigning Messiah. Reigning Messiah. Just deliver us from the oppression of the Roman authorities. Deliver us from Rome. They're not looking at the one who was pierced, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. They were not looking for the suffering Messiah. And that is a result of them not understanding the Scriptures. They expect another prophet, one like Moses. They should have been looking for a Redeemer. John really could have exalted himself, but there was no, you see nothing in the text that indicates what in any way whatsoever. And John was like us in, in many aspects. He was just like us, but he did not exalt himself. They should have anticipated one crying in the wilderness. It's just like, I, it just, I guess, and maybe I'm not doing a very good job of getting the point across here, folks, but just step back, look at the broad picture. Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
and a small band of chosen followers standing against a world religious system that claimed to have all the authority, all of the answers, and yet their eyes were blind. No, they, they wanted it in Jerusalem. They wanted it in the temple. They wanted it in their circles. They're anticipating that the voice shouldn't be in the wilderness, but that's where God's people are. They're outside of that ecclesiastical system. We are outside of that ecclesiastical system. We are God's people. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.